Hello, and welcome to the GC80 Show. My name is Amanda Skofsted, Public Affairs Officer for the Episcopal Church. Today's guest is the Right Reverend Mark Latim, Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Alaska and co-chair of the Joint Nominating Committee for the election of the presiding bishop. I had the opportunity to sit down virtually with Bishop Mark, he and his diocesan office in Alaska, and I and the Episcopal Church's digital media team in our studio in New York City. We talked about the composition and mandate of this committee for electing the presiding bishop, the role of listening in the discernment process, and, on the more practical level, the timetable in the process. Let's take a look. Bishop Mark, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. So, tell us a little bit about the Joint Nominating Committee for the Election of the Presiding Bishop. What is the mandate of this group and where are you in the process? Well, the Joint Nominating Committee for the Election of the Presiding Bishop's mandate is basically to present to the general convention that will be electing the next presiding bishop, which is the general convention coming up in 2024. Uh, we, are, we are tasked with presenting a slate of at least three nominees for the House of Bishops to elect, and of course the House of Deputies then to confirm that election. Can you describe the composition um, in addition to kind of roles and orders? Um, talk a little bit about the age and diversity of the members of this committee. It is fun, let me tell you. It, it, is, it is great to be on a committee that has the level of diversity that this committee has. Uh, we, as I said, we have 20 members total, the, mm -hmm. the five bishops, the five, and then, and then um, the 15 others from, um, to, to make up to the full composition. We represent over all nine provinces of the Episcopal Church, uh, which you know is global. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, we have folks on the committee from Central Ecuador right on up to well, yours truly representing here in Alaska. Uh, Fourteen dioceses uh, between us, and we range in age from college students right on up to retirees, people from various vocational backgrounds. It's an exciting group. Wow. So, I, you know, talk a little bit about the process of discernment. What does, what does discernment look like in a group such as this? Well, you know, I think uh, the, the foundation of discernment, of course, is listening, listening deeply, uh, mm. primarily listening for the Holy Spirit, but we know that the Holy Spirit speaks through the church and through the members of the church. So we see sort of as our initial and, and perhaps our most important task is to engage that deep listening in a prayerful and in an open and inviting way. Uh, so that's kind of what where we're starting. Uh, we're, we're listening, we're seeking ways that we can most effectively invite uh, others to share what they discern as mm -hmm. the, the, next, the, the gifts and charisms that will be necessary for the next presiding bishop to lead us uh, in, into the future. Great, and let's, let's, um, let's pause a little bit um, and talk about what it means to listen to this church. What does it mean to um, not exactly pull, but invite the feedback of of Episcopalians, you know, what they what they have in mind as their hopes and dreams for the church, um, and also what skills and gifts uh, they, they imagine the next presiding bishop will need. What does that process look like, and how can people maybe participate? The church is a huge body to, right. to yeah. and we want, we want to get as much input from as uh, broad of uh, representation of our church as possible. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's probably ridiculous to even mention it, but we were a little sad that in this time of pandemic, um, we've witnessed and experienced so many changes uh, to yeah. our, our structures. We were hopeful, in fact, to have this absolutely uh, unique, uh, unprecedented opportunity to have the committee at General Convention to uh, be able to have a booth at the in the exhibition hall and to really 
opportunities to engage people face to face. But alas, that's not going to happen because of uh, the changes that have been made to General Convention to protect us all. Right. Um, yep. But we've we've learned, you know, there, there, there's some positive things that have come out of uh, this pandemic. And, and one of them is I think the church has become more and more comfortable with these sorts of interactions. So uh, we don't have anything specific. I mean, we're still working on some of these ways, but I, I think we yeah. can ex- I think we can anticipate that there will be opportunities for uh online forums where people will have an opportunity to, uh, people will will have an opportunity to Mm -hmm. uh, share their uh, discernment. Uh, There will be polls, obviously we'll we'll need to have polls. Uh, I know that our committee members will will be interested in uh, talking to uh, deputies and representatives in their various areas and we'll begin that, we'll begin that gathering process. I wonder what you think is the role or inv- invitation um, to prayer for the church around this process. You know, I think we obviously the the church is holy because it is where the Holy Spirit resides, and uh, I like to say, and this is true even when I'm working with a parish that that's looking for their next leader, their next rector, or priest in charge that. You know, we believe that the Holy Spirit has already got this figured out mm-hmm. um, and, and, and will guide us if we are faithful in, and prayerful uh, and careful in listening and, um, and praying and uh, asking, in fact, for those, of, for those of us on the committee, but in fact, for the whole church um, to, uh, to have that gift of insight, um, mm-hmm. that gift of, uh, you know, um, of openness to, uh, to what the, what the spirit is saying to the church. Um, yeah. so, so we, we cherish the prayers of the church, uh, for this committee and our work. Um, but we also cherish the entire church's prayers, uh, for the entire body. Uh, yeah. in this work of identifying and raising up the next presiding bishop. Um, you know, I'd, it occurs to me that not everybody knows, you know, what the kind of uh, requirements or parameters, um, you know, age and that sort of thing. Like, what are some of the parameters um, or necessary conditions for to become a presiding bishop? What What can you tell us about that? Well, you know, there, there are, there are canons um, that, that guide this process Uh, and there are some uh, practices that we have we have sort of uh, followed um, that in fact are not really in the canons which is for for example Mm. um, one of the we ask about the requirements well canonically the requirements are the person is a is a bishop of uh, a member of the house of bishops uh-huh. Um, okay. a, a member in good standing of the House of Bishops, right? Um, but there's no ter- there's there's no time uh, canonically uh, assigned to that, meaning that it, it's not a requirement that a bishop ha- has served for any number of years before consideration for mm-hmm. election, um, and in fact, nor is there really an age requirement or limitation. Now. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the term is nine years, right. and it is our practice that we, we have typically looked as nominating committees uh, for people who can meet that entire term. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, but from a, from a purely canonical experience, there is no reason somebody who is not, um, someone who is not able to serve for the full nine years before turning the mandatory retirement age of 72, there, there's no reason why a person like that couldn't be considered. Obviously, hmm. okay. we would be yeah. setting ourselves up for a shortened term for presiding bishop. Um, yeah. So, you know, so those are the canons, but obviously as a nominating committee, we're going to look, uh, we're going to honor those, we're going to be true to those, uh, but our task is also to look at what would be best for um, what we're hearing from the church, what would be best for the church's leadership in their next presiding bishop. So that might be, um, yeah, it wouldn't make much sense for us to put somebody uh, forward who who could only serve for a, a short part of the, the nine-year term. 
Right. Um, Right. I wonder also, could you just walk us kind of through the process and timeline? Um, so you mentioned the, uh, you know, the goal is to present a slate of at least three bishops to stand for election in 2024. But between now and then, um, what what will kind of take place just in broad overview? Yeah. And of course, that's all I can do right now anyways, is paint with a very broad brush. Yeah. Um, so so our uh, our timeline looks something like this. Uh, we we are now in to this uh, this process of learning of, of listening and 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 discerning about the the needs, the hopes, the desires of the church, um, and and what gifts and, and um, skills will be uh, best suited to that in the in in the next um, presiding bishop. Uh, so then we anticipate to bring all of that together in what would be a, a profile, um, uh -huh. a, a summary of all of that, and be able to present that and publish that to the church uh, in the spring of next year. So spring of 2023 uh, is our timeline for, for posting the profile and uh, offering it for people to um, read, mark, and inwardly digest, and then to yeah. begin to 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 think about who they know or who they, they feel would be a potential um, candidate. Then what will happen is in the fall of that year, fall of next year, 2023, we will open uh, the nomination process and all of that will be shared with the church, the, the, the ways to do it, um, how to do it, yeah. uh, what's required of, of people who are being nominated. Um, all of that will be open and We'll post the timelines so that uh, the nomination committee can begin or continue its work of listening, but also begin its work of going through those nominations, um, conducting interviews, uh, doing the necessary background checks, right. uh, just digging deep into the candidates. By the way, um, yes. just as an aside, but on that topic, Mm -hmm. um, people who are nominated, not just a presiding bishop, but nominated to any positions in the church, they are really giving of themselves very mm. generously and opening themselves yeah. up to extreme vulnerability. Yep. So I would say that the prayers that we are engaging now for listening, learning would continue, but also prayers for, for everybody. When you make a nomination, make it prayerfully and continue to support your nominee in, in prayer. Um, because it is a it, it, it's 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 a sure. gift that these nominees give to the church to mm. it, to offer themselves, and um, I think it's important that we honor that. So the nomination committee will will go through its work, and then our target, our goal, is to then present a slate of at least three, um, maybe more, mm -hmm. um, but it won't be less or it won't be fewer. Um, <laughs> of nominees in the spring, April, May, uh -huh. um, with enough time uh, for people to be able to read through those and pray some more about those in anticipation of the electing convention uh, in in the summer of uh, 24. And um, there will be a process, of course, it's canonically required, there will be a process for petition uh, that will open at that time. And we will post timelines on that as well, because mm -hmm. it, it's also crucial that uh, any of our petition candidates follow the same or go through a similar, very similar process, and certainly the same level of background checking and um, review. Uh, you know, and on that topic, what, what are some of the requirements on background checks and that, like, it, I believe, and you can tell me if this is mistaken, I think there may have been some recent changes to how that, some of that is done, for instance, it sounds as though someone cannot be nominated from the floor given the required background checks. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's, that's true. My, that is also my understanding that um, okay. because of that, because of the, the need for there to be a, a, a thorough background check, uh, this is why we will, this is why there will be timelines uh, and, and dates in advance mm -hmm. uh, for the petition process to be sure that we're able to do those background checks. Got it. You know, any, any, 
kind of closing thoughts on um, anything we haven't discussed or covered or that you would like to say to the church um, on this on this topic as as this committee embarks on its work and the whole church uh, is is invited to you know discerning together. Well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you for uh, your your listening. Thank you for your prayers. I am delighted. It, it is a gift to uh, and a gift to be a co-chair with uh, Dr. Stephen Nishiyabashi, um in this process. The committee is just fabulous. I mean, uh, just wonderful. And I would ask that as long while the church is praying in discernment, that um, join me. Uh, in praying, in thanksgiving, and in gratitude that God has given us such extraordinary gifts in the people who have been elected. Um, and uh, I also know that sometimes these processes can be infused with a certain degree of anxiety. Mm, yeah. um, we will do everything we can uh, as a committee to to make communication open. Um, communication is, is two ways. So we also want to make sure folks um, uh, know that they can uh, contact the committee if they have questions or concerns. Um, we have uh, a wonderful subcommittee on communications. Um, Mary Frances uh, Schoenberg is uh, sort of the lead of that and they're just great. So I uh, give thanks for the ministry of, of our presiding bishop. Certainly give thanks uh, to Michael Curry, who has been such mm. a wonderful leader. Uh, yes. over over his term in these unexpected times. I mean, who would have ever thought? Yeah. Um, yeah. And to trust that just as the Holy Spirit has uh, worked with, with, with Michael um, in these unexpected times, we can trust that the Holy Spirit will call the person um, to lead us in the unexpected uh, times ahead. Well, thank you so much for for sharing this with us. And thank you also for your work on this committee. It's very important work and we're grateful to you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to talk about this work and, um, and to invite everyone to be partners with us. To find out more about the work of this committee, visit them on social media by searching PB28 nominations. Special thanks to our partners at Church Pension Group Trinity Wall Street, and Episcopal Relief and Development for making this show possible. I encourage you to learn more about our sponsors in the description and links that accompany this video.